So avoiding symptoms go with infection. And the answer is to treat the infection and then the avoiding symptoms go. have a couple of questions uh, from a different perspective it is about diagnostics but yeah. it's more about imaging like ultrasound yes. or cystoscopy yeah. and what symptoms would a patient present with that would mean you might suggest this would be a good idea for them well we we, we expect a hundred percent of our patients to have a renal tract ultrasound okay largely because I don't want to overlook stone disease mm -hmm. and that if someone's got a very heavy pyuria and they're not responding we can't get the damped oscillation going mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll image them again to look for stone disease because in the past I've gone and missed stones that had formed on me without realizing it okay. if someone has persistent blood in the urine even if they've got a, a urine infection we will we will do an ultrasound scan we'll do urine cytology and we'll do a cystoscopy just to check for a bladder polyp or precancerous mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. that's it okay there is no need for any other imaging at all it's expensive I, I, it troubles me that some people are exposed to awful uh, yeah. radiation doses um and um the the, the one of the, the the our team the doctors working for us are forbidden to organize a test unless they can write the hypothesis that they're testing down in the notes. Mm -hmm. So they, they have to write, I'm arranging an ultrasound scan because I want to check for stone disease and I'm checking for stone disease because this patient is behaving in a way that we previously have associated with stone disease. Mm -hmm. It's like that. They're not allowed to do a test just to get the patient out the room or to do a micorborist test, um, which is, uh, I'll do a test and something might turn up. Right. Absolutely forbidden to do that. It was a very serious offence. Mm -hmm. So um, the net result is our investigations are, are very, very limited indeed. If something is found on a, a cystoscopy like Hunter's lesions, is that something that will make you change your treatment approach? Or no. do you consider the, the, that the, the, the thing is that, that I, one, I want them all to get clear about what they mean by Hunter's lesions mm -hmm. because if you look at the hist if you go back to Hunter's original work and look at the histology mm -hmm. all right it's identical to chronic cystitis mm -hmm. and chronic cystitis will be associated with ulceration um, right. as part of it um, and the, the 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 I've gone through numerous photo uh, micrographs in order to to look at this and um, the Hunter's lesion is an ulcer with chronic cystitis um, and i think that there might be an incredibly rare condition that involves some strange ulcer that you might say okay is this a let's call this something different whatever it is but it's a very odd disease but it's so rare mm -hmm. that that it's 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 hard to come by and i i, I you know that what, 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 I don't know, what was that thing where people were getting a terrible cystitis from a recreational drug that you normally feed to horses? I've forgotten what it was. Oh. That alerted me to the fact, you know, some of these rare lesions might be related to another etiological thing. Mm. We've got to look at it. Okay. But, but the, the, frankly, the classic interstitial cystitis type people have got chronic cystitis. And and there's another one or two. All right. So that deals with that. And if you look into a chronic system, you would expect to see some ulceration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have a lot of your patients previously been diagnosed with IC? Yeah. Very, very, the majority. And uh, you find they respond in the same way to people who haven't been diagnosed that way? Yes. I can't tell the difference. Now, I'll tell you. So, so let, let, well, how do they diagnose? institutional cystitis mm -hmm. well first of all the person's got symptoms of cystitis and their negative culture yeah okay yeah well fine and the, 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 you know the, the, what do you expect when the <laughs> when the test is incompetent exactly second thing is that someone does a cystoscopy blows up the bladder for some extraordinary reason yeah and then says oh we've got glomerulations well Glomerul 
glomerulations mean a capillary burst mm -hmm. all right as simple as it's a bruise yeah all right and the point about if you've got a, a cystitis the blood vessels of the bladder are dilated and the the capillaries are stuffed full of blood and the other thing is that that the capillaries are incredibly friable they break very easily and if you stretch the bladder i assure you that some of these capillaries will be exposed to uh, uh, shear stresses mm -hmm. that are more than enough to cause them to rip so they burst and they bleed and it gives you a, a glomerulation well you'd expect that if you've got cystitis and in fact i super years ago i supervised a girl who did her master's degree and she she compared normal people with people with so-called dis institutional cystitis and we saw no difference between for normals and others in terms mm -hmm. of the glomerulations and stuff that the other thing is this mast cell thing mast cells evolutionary speaking incredibly ancient mm -hmm. entities and you you've got to sort of see them as a sort of uh, all-purpose hand grenade that gets chucked at the problem Mm -hmm. And it's part of the innate immune system. And they, they explode there and they create all sorts of inflammatory cytokines to keep it all going on. They have a very important role in stimulating shedding of the epithelial cells. All right. So, so they're, they're important in terms of getting rid of the infected cells. So if you're a pregnant woman and you're shedding lots of epithelial mm -hmm. cells, I should hope that there will be mast cells in your bladder making that happen. I have no idea why people focused on mast cells and created this mast cell allergy story that mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense to me at all. And certainly all the micrographs I've seen of interstitial cystitis have the same number of mast cells there as, as you get in rheumatoid arthritis or anything else. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's specific in any way whatsoever. Okay. Now, another question is around bladder retention and whether that predisposes you to infection, particularly in people with neurogenic bladder. We think it does not. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we did a, oh, we did an experiment on that a while ago that Linda Collins and I did, um, where we were creating retention in people by using Botox as part of their treatment. Mm -hmm. and we we scrutinized those that used catheters and those the intermittent catheterization and those that didn't and there was no difference okay the the, the point is that the avoiding the, the avoiding problem of if you get a an inflammation of the lower urinary tract the tissues will swell mm -hmm. so I, I i've always said that i think bladder wall thickness that's found on ultrasound is probably just the effect of inflammation just mm -hmm. as you know if you if you sprain your ankle it swells because of the inflammation and you'll get swelling in the urethra so that that'll cause the urethra to close up and it gets harder to pee through mm -hmm. so one of the things we found in our aggregate analysis is that the voiding symptoms hesitancy reduced dream intermittency and terminal dribbling are the earliest symptoms of an infection okay. that's what people start with so voiding symptoms go with infection and the answer is to treat the infection and then the voiding symptoms go so i in fact think that the voiding problem is in fact a product of the infection and not right. the other way around and frankly i can't i can't understand why would a residual at the base of the bladder encourage infection it, it doesn't make any sense to me um there will always be debris at the base of the bladder because you know it's it's part of our protective mechanism mm -hmm. for people that do have neurogenic bladder do you use the same protocol for treatment yes and uh that we will it's in ms where we'll tend to start using intermittent catheterization ms spinal injuries where the mm -hmm. areas where you'd use intermittent catheterization we use the 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 similar protocol certainly if catheters are involved with anybody we'll be desperate to get them onto hip prex on its own as soon mm -hmm. as possible okay sure so people often ask us how they can approach their own doctor with data like yours i know now you're about to publish a book which i think is intended for practitioners aside from buying the book for their doctor do you have any other advice about that i i, I mean we're, we're i i suppose uh, yes at the end of the book 
got it for me. The, the last paragraph of the book provides a question that you can put to the doctors. Mm -hmm. And what it, it, it says is this, look, I've got all these symptoms that are indicative of a chronic urine infection. And there is a, a large body of science now out there saying that it's probably a urine infection. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there's an enormous amount of science that demonstrates that the tests that you're using are useless. Useless. And that's not just from one centre, it's from centres all around the world. Given those facts, what are you going to do about this? All right. And, and that's really what it boils down to. Um, and it, my view is, well, it puts you back to the medicine that you were taught at medical school and which was um, Osler's medicine. His comment, listen to the patient. He is telling you what the diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. So you're not doing anything controversial. You're saying, why don't you treat me according to the history and the clinical examination? Now, if you don't want to do that, why not? Mm -hmm. And what is the science, please, in writing that, that justifies your position? All right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way. It's a bit like Socrates, you know, dealt with so much by asking questions, not by, um, not by saying, no, well, it's this, that, and the other. It's constantly asking the questions. So it's like this. They say to you, you couldn't have a urine infection the culture's negative mm -hmm. and you say well how do you make that out when there's so many publications saying that the culture's grossly insensitive mm -hmm. yeah? yeah have you considered the base rate fallacy and all that kind of i think that's the best is to approach it through the questions but i hope in the book i mean at least you can say actually this is all talked about in this book mm -hmm. so why don't you read it um is 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 useful because you're in the past we've had to say why don't you go and look up these scientific papers all yeah. right now i i know that's that's quite a tough order because when, when the doctors are coming to me to first start their research to their horror they discover that they, they they're not good at reading scientific papers mm -hmm. they find it really difficult and they struggle and their concentration wanes and so on. And they, they can't understand how it is that I can read a scientific paper and digest it and spew it back at them in the mm -hmm. way that I do. Well, I tell them it's because I've been doing it yeah, exactly. for 45 years every day. You've got to train at it. Now, mm -hmm. m m there are not that many doctors who, are, who, who will be reading scientific papers every day of the week and so on and so forth. So putting it as a book is very useful. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things is, uh, uh, with I was very unkeen that we we wrote review papers in the sort of general comic comics, because I I I felt that we shouldn't do that until we we set out the science very mm -hmm. publicly and had it had it had it discussed and criticised. <laughs>